more impressive ones off the top. Um, he's a former president of the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, it's up in Michigan. Uh, president of the Foundation for Economic Education in New York, which is where he'll be going in a couple weeks, back to New York. Um, authored over 1,000 newspaper articles, dozens of articles in magazines and journals uh, in the United States and abroad, including five books. Uh, since 1978, he's given over 1,000 speeches in 40 states, 15 countries, including one at the People's University in Beijing, China, which I'm sure that was a pretty interesting uh, occasion. So uh, please welcome Larry Reed. Thank you, Vince. Thank you, everyone. I didn't know about the basket that uh, Vince just mentioned, and I, I don't need a speaker fee. So let me just tell you that uh, I hope you will put something in it, knowing that it will go to a much worthier cause uh, than me. Uh, so whatever goes in there is yours. Oh, thank you. Brian, if I take my jacket off, is I going to mess up your video? Uh, well, I'm delighted to be with you tonight. Uh, I know you are believers in liberty. We need so many more of you. We're working on that. And every chance I have to talk to people who share ideals of liberty, I, I thoroughly enjoy. I want to call your attention, uh, attention to some uh, uh, things we've brought for you. Uh, in the back, and it's, or maybe we've already passed them out. We've got a couple essays. Uh, Vince, underneath the... Uh, uh, I pencil in that big box is also uh, a large quantity of great myths of the Great Depression. Okay. So I'd like everybody to have one of those uh, with our compliments at fee, as well as that little green booklet uh, called I pencil. And I didn't quite, I should have grabbed more of these, but this is especially uh, noteworthy if you're a student, I hope, or know a student. You, know, you might want to send to our uh, summer seminars. These are, we've got a few flyers here. Uh, every summer, FEE puts on week-long seminars for high school and college students. And this summer, eight of them, eight week-long seminars will be for college students, and one is for high school students. And uh, uh, they are intensive boot camps for liberty, you might say. And every bit of information you need or a student would need to sign up is also on our website at FEE.org. So even if we don't have enough for everybody of these flyers, uh, go to fee.org, F-E-E, -E, and you'll see uh, all the details about our summer seminars. Uh, remind me, Vince, because I brought two sets of notes. Which talk tonight did we? The, uh, my favorite president. My favorite president. Good. That's the one I was hoping we had. Uh, I know we talked about seven principles, but that, that's what we actually mailed you. Correct. Uh, great. Uh, I love talking about presidential history, even though our work at Fee focuses on economics. Uh, my first love, personally, is economic history, uh, and especially the history of uh, America uh, after uh, the colonial period and up until the first part of this uh, last century. We've had 43, now 44 presidents, and uh, I don't know if any of you have visited our website. If you have, you might know who my favorite is. Otherwise, we didn't advertise it ahead of time, but I can assure you it's not Bill Clinton, it's not Jimmy Carter, it's not the current one, it's not the last one. In fact, you have to go quite a ways back. Another uh, Fillmore. No, although he wasn't bad. <laughs> by, by recent standards, he looks pretty good. <laughs> a lot of them do. Uh, there are times when I am tempted to say uh, William Henry Harrison might have been my favorite president because he caught uh, a cold at inauguration and died with it died within a month and never was around long enough to do any harm. <laughs> but uh, but I, I think if he had hung around, he would not have been a good president. He was uh, a Whig who uh, believed in things like a national central bank and internal improvements, which, which meant government subsidies and a lot of stuff that uh, I wouldn't have gone along with uh, had I been around back then. Uh, I heard a man some years ago talking about uh, a recent string of presidents, beginning with Franklin Roosevelt, and he put it this way. He said, Franklin Roosevelt proved that a man could be president a lifetime. Harry Truman proved that any man could be president. Dwight Eisenhower proved that we really didn't need one. And every president since has proven that it's dangerous to have one. <laughs> <laughs> the one I want to talk to you tonight, however, is uh, a very good one. 
And although I wouldn't necessarily say he was our best, um, I go back and forth on who I might rank as number one. So I usually say, this guy is certainly in the top half dozen. Uh, but he's my personal favorite for reasons that will become apparent in a few moments. I have simply enjoyed um, uh, the study of this uh, man and had an occasion a few years ago to actually meet his son. The president I'm referring to was Grover Cleveland. That's who we're going to talk about tonight. And you might be thinking, if you know any American history, you met his son? Wasn't he president way back in the late 19th century? He was president for the first time from 1885 to 89, ran for re-election in 88, and lost, although uh, he lost only in the Electoral College, not in the popular vote, one of only three, maybe four times in our history when that's happened, 2000 being the more recent uh, case. And then he ran again in 1892 and served a second term. Uh, in 1995, I was reading an almanac of politics, uh, which had a lot of trivia in it about every president to that date, including uh, their children, their children's names, where they lived, their birth dates, and their death dates. And so I was reading through the Cleveland section, and it listed the five children of Grover Cleveland and his wife, uh, Frances. And the five children uh, were listed. And they all had death dates except for the last one, born in 1903, when Grover was 67 years of age and, uh, and had been out of the White House for several years. He, he left in 1897 and was a former president for quite a few years. By the time in 1903, he was uh, a father for the fifth time. And so I'm reading this, and it says, Francis, named for his mother, Cleveland, born 1903, the fifth of five Cleveland children. It had no death date, and it said Tamworth, New Hampshire. And I thought, well, this is a very recent book. Could this guy still be living? He'd be 92, and the oldest living child of an American president, whose presidential father goes back further than any of the others. And uh, so I called information for Tamworth, New Hampshire, and got a number for a Francis Cleveland, and called it. A man answered, and I said, is this Francis Cleveland? And he said, yes, it is. And I said, the son of the former president? And he said, that's me. <laughs> and I remember I was so excited because I'd written about his father many times. In fact, my first article about Grover Cleveland was as a college student in the early 70s. It never dawned on me he'd have a son still living in 1995. So I said, well, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of your father's, and I've got a blow-up of a $1,000 bill, a picture of one, framed and hanging in my dining room because your dad's picture's on it. And uh, I'm coming up to New York this summer. This was in May of 95 to give a couple speeches in July and then a couple in August. I'd like to rent a car and drive up to New Hampshire to see you. Could I do that? And here's what he said, 92 years of age. He said, well, 65 years ago, I started a performing arts company here in Tamworth called The Barnstormers, and I'm still directing it. I'm completely booked in July. <laughs> Can you come in August? So I said, all right. And a colleague of mine, you may know him, Bert Folsom, the author of a new book called New Deal or Raw Deal, which I hardly recommend, he and I went up and spent an evening with uh, Francis Cleveland. And it was a remarkable several hours to talk with him. In fact, I said at one point, Francis, you have to understand uh, why this is such a thrill. Uh, because not only have I uh, you know, been a great fan of your father's, uh, but uh, I'm talking to a man whose father, not grandfather, but whose father was first elected president of the United States 111 years ago in 1884. And I'm talking to a son. And he said without skipping a beat, he said, that's nothing. Cleveland's tend to marry late, they have children late, <laughs> and my grandfather, he said, Grover's dad, was an infant when Thomas Jefferson was in the White House. Oh, so, you know, what do you, what, right. you can imagine what, yeah, what a young country that you could be talking to somebody in 1995 whose grandfather was alive when Thomas Jefferson was president. Well, uh, Francis was in fine health for a 92-year-old, 